Well, good morning, folks. What a joy it is to welcome you as we gather together to worship the Lord. Some of us, including ourselves, have been in holiday, you and I, and that was a blessing. Uh, others have been in holiday and are back, and others will be yet be going on holiday. But as we come together this morning to worship God, it is good to be in this place. In Psalm 139, verse 7, we read, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. We gather as believers, as those who God in his grace and mercy have brought from the domain of darkness into his kingdom of light. We gather to worship him this morning. Those verses I read from Psalm 139 are part of the psalm that we'll look at in a little while in our worship this morning. But as we begin our gathered worship, let us sing together in praise a setting of the 139th Psalm called, You Are Before Me, Lord, You Are Behind. Now, those words may not be familiar uh, to some of you, but I'm sure to many the tune will be familiar. We sing this to the tune of Highland Cathedral. So let us stand together as we sing. <laughs> Creation which he has not only brought into being, 
but that creation which he sustains by his power from the highest heights to the depths of the sea. by the tearing of a a great divider. That curtain in the temple which separated sinful man from that place where your presence was most typified in those days. Yet symbolized a greater a greater new and living way into the very presence of God. 
opened up for us by your Son, the Lord Jesus. So it's in Jesus' name we come as we bring you our worship this morning. You're the God who, who knows our ways. You know our days. You know our situation. You know our location. You, you know everything about us, Father. And perhaps sometimes such knowledge could cause us to run and hide. But before you, our hearts and our minds are laid bare. We need not hide, for you know us, and you see. So, Father, as we would continue to bring you our worship this morning, we pray that you would be pleased to speak to our hearts through your word. We thank you, Father, for those who indeed have already gathered back from times of holiday. Others who may yet go and others who'll just be busy around their, their homes in, in these coming days. Father, our prayer would be that you would watch over each one. Father, especially watch over the little ones. Some on holiday, others here among us this morning, Father. That you would watch over them and keep them safe. Father, all of these things we would ask before you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we make our way through the, the summer months, uh, really leading up to uh, our family service on the 20th of August, when we have our back to school Sunday, but up until then, for, for the activities for the primary school age children, Sunday school, there's no Bible class running uh, over those weeks, but uh, there is for the likes of Sam, Zachary, and Amelia. So this would be a good opportunity for you now uh, to be able to go and see what I think Jean and Elspeth today have got in hand for you. come to God's word this morning, uh, we're going to sing another, another relatively new song, uh, but I often feel that when we're singing new songs, it helps if we're singing them to tunes that we know. And therefore, in Mission Praise, there's a, a lovely hymn of preparation as we come to the word of God, uh, a hymn called Spirit of God, unseen as the wind in our hearts. We pray that God's Holy Spirit would speak to us today through his word as this hymn reminds us that is what God has given us his word for. He speaks to us through his word. So, Spirit of God, I'm seen as the wind. And this, in mission praise, is set to the sky boat song. So we won't get into any historical Scottish politics this morning uh, related to that original song and tune. We will just enjoy it as a tune that I'm sure we all know as we sing these lovely words of a hymn, Spirit of God, unseen as the wind. <laughs>
these two, the 139th Psalm, Psalm 139, this time we'll read all 24 verses. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O Lord. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. O oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O oh God. And know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. And this is the word of God. Over these next few weeks, God willing, as I said, we look forward on the 20th of August to having our back to school Sunday. And uh, that's a family service as we acknowledge the families within our church and at present the, the, the teachers that we have in the church, two teachers, uh, as they go back into the, the school year. But rather than delve back into our ongoing studies in John's Gospel uh, and of folks perhaps missing out on those who might have wanted to follow them through, I want us over these four weeks, God willing, to, to look at four psalms. Each quite different psalms, but each with a message for us. And this morning, we come to Psalm 139 to, to a message really just entitled, The God Who Knows. Psalm 139 is all about the God who knows us, knows everything about us, knows everything about our situation, knows everything uh, about our circumstances, knows everything about our hearts, knows everything about our days. This is the God who knows. And no matter what circumstance you are coming from this morning, no matter what has happened in the week that has gone behind us, or even know even what may happen in this coming week, we have a God who knows 
our circumstances. Look at these first six verses with me, if, if you would. The psalmist begins, of course, by saying, you have searched me and known me. That this, this is not simply someone who's, as it were, doing an interrogation, you have searched me. The psalmist is secure in the knowledge that the one who is God is one who knows him. That's a remarkable truth, friends. And it's true not only of the psalmist David, it's true of each and every one of us who knows the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And the truth is all the more remarkable when we remember that the Bible tells us that he has known us, those whose trust is in him. He has known us from before the earth's foundation. Let's remind us that our God is omniscient. He is also beyond time. But those are circumstances. See in verse 2, where we read there, he is the God who knows our sitting down and our rising up. You know when I sit down and, and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. Can you imagine how spooky it might be if you went into perhaps a, a holiday let or a hotel and then you saw something up on the ceiling and you thought, that's odd. <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time some of these places have had little hidden cameras, often for all sorts of nefarious purposes. And we feel a bit awkward. We feel a bit strange. And if we didn't actually pack up and leave, we'd probably get some gaffer tape and put it over it. But how do we feel when we realize that we have a God who knows our sitting down, our rising up? A God who, in verse 3, we're reminded, searches out our paths and our lying down and is acquainted with all my ways. Does that bring comfort? Or does that bring perhaps a wee bit of awkwardness, a, a wee bit of concern? It all depends how we see this God. For if we see this God as a caring Father, who every moment of every day from the moment we were conceived has cared about us, and watched over us, then friends, there is no need for fear. The knowledge that he knows, rather than causing us to run and hide, and we'll consider that later as we move on through this passage, the knowledge that he knows are sitting down or rising up, that he knows our ways, should bring us wonderful comfort. Even our thoughts and our words, verse 4, we, we read there, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You know, am I the only one as I've got older that sometimes the period of time between a word being in my mind and getting to my tongue stretches? I'm trying to think of the word I want to use, but it's not always quite coming. Even God who knows exactly what's in my We have a God who knows even before we speak. Not just what we're saying, but what we're thinking. Truly, the psalmist says this knowledge is too wonderful for me, he says in, in verse 6. It is high, I cannot attain it. It's a God who knows our circumstances. But you know, the Bible uses that word know in different ways. We tend to use the word as, as, as just in terms of knowledge. You know, well, I know what four times four makes. It makes 16. Someone reminded me recently, even minus four times minus four still makes 16. I know where to find the mass when we leave here and go home. Unless something truly cataclysmic has happened to Preston. 
But that's totally different from actually knowing someone. The difference between knowing about something or even knowing about someone and knowing them is the difference between factual and personal. If you have personal knowledge of someone, you know them. And of course, that's the remarkable truth that lies behind those verses in Scripture that tell us that, that those who are the Lord's, he is known from before the earth's foundation. It's not simply some sort of knowledge that, that we at one point would exist, or, or even that at one point in time we would put our trust in him. It's knowing in terms of a relationship with us. A loving relationship. That he doesn't simply know, but he loves and he understands. To my mind, one of the most beautiful examples of, of that sense of God knowing is in Exodus chapter 2. Now, you'll know that Exodus is, is that story of how God brings his people out of Egypt where they were slaves. You know, God had worked wonderfully in Egypt. He had, he had used Joseph to, 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 to bring blessing to Egypt, but as the scriptures tell us, there then arose a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. And as God blessed the, the, the Hebrew people, Numerically, this new pharaoh began to get worried and he began to enslave the people. And they cried out to God and, and we read these words in Exodus chapter 2 verse 23 and following. During those many days the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Dear ones, no matter what situation you may be in just now, that I might be aware of, be partly aware of, or be totally unaware of, I say to you with the confidence that we find in the word of God, God knows. That same sort of comfort. The only comes from one who has already been there, who comes alongside and says, I know. I've never forgotten, if you'll forgive me a personal example. I was sitting by the bedside of my sister in, 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 in Gart Naval Hospital back in the December of 1981. By this time, she was in a coma. And when a friend who had only been a believer a matter of months would come in, I would sit there for maybe half an hour or so, just sit quietly, then open a little New Testament and read some verses and pray, and then we just look at us and say, I know. I know. The difference was, just over a year previously, he was the one who had sat by the cot side of his little baby as that little baby's life drained away. Now the difference between a baby and a 25 year old may span the years, but when it's your child, he knew what we were feeling. When he said, I know, there wasn't just sympathy, there was empathy. We don't simply have a God who is sympathetic of our situations. He is empathetic. He enters into them with us. So that's why I say to you, friends, whatever the circumstance, God is not simply aware. God knows. He knows. Not only does he know our circumstances, he knows our location. For from verse 7 through to verse 12, we, we, we find this question opening this part of the psalm. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? You know? Well, if I go up to heaven, I get out to show the, the, the domain of the, 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 the spirit of the dead. 
you're still there. If we soar up into the highest heights or go down to the depths of the sea, you're still there. If it's the darkness of night or the brightness of day, God is still there. Friends, these verses here are surely once again an example of of that on the one hand, a caution, on the other, a comfort. The caution that if we think somehow that we can take ourselves, as it were, out of God's sphere of knowledge, then we're fooling ourselves because God is not only omniscient and knowing all things, God is only present by His Spirit. That's completely different from the pantheism that says God is in all things. You know, God's in the stones, God's in the trees, so let's, you know, worship Mother Nature. No, totally different from that. But there is no place where God's Spirit cannot see us and cannot find us. For He is there. So that is a caution. If we were, as it were, to, to think that, well, somehow there's some things that we can hide from God. I was never even all that great at hiding things from my teachers or my parents. You know? I usually get caught out pretty easily. Oh, there's absolutely nothing we can hide from God. Nothing. Yeah, right in the middle of that little stanza, as it were, in Psalm 139, verse 10 says this, Follows on from verse 9 where it says, If I take the wings of the morning, well, nothing is part of the sea. Even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Did you notice that as we read it? Your right hand shall hold me. It's not simply that he knows. It's not simply that he's there. It is this wonderful truth that is true, as I repeat again, friends, for every believer, that, that he's holding on to us. You know, God willing, we'll come back to John's gospel. We'll come to those wonderful verses that remind us that when Jesus says, no one can pluck you from my hand, and no one can pluck you from the Father's hand, I and the Father are one, and I can't help but imagine you. How good it is to know that, you know, I've got no hands for you. The Father has one hand, the Son has the other. And even though I might fear of losing my grip, they're never going to lose their grip. They're never going to lose their grip. But let's trust that God will bring us to that further down the road when we get back to John's Gospel. But rather than go to John's Gospel this morning, I want to go to Psalm 73. So that's turning back a few pages in our Bibles and I'm sorry, it's not on the slide, but uh, I'll read these words, and if you have a Bible there in front of you, perhaps good to read them as well in Psalm 73, and beginning to read at verse 23. Now, this is a psalm where Asaph, who's writing this psalm, is, is kind of struggling. He's, he's looking on at the world. And he sees all the bad guys doing well. <laughs> he sees all the rogues making a fortune. They've got everything. And he thinks, surely there's something wrong here. Surely that's not how it's meant to be. And, and then he begins to realize, I shouldn't really be speaking like that, he says. And, and then I realized that actually their time will come. They'll get their comeuppance. And then he begins to think about the blessings that are his. And in verse 23 he says, Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold my right hand. 
You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you'll receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? There's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. But, you know, when we read that verse 10 and 139, where, where the psalmist says, your right hand shall hold me. And then we flick back to 73, where we read, you hold my right hand. Is the psalmist here in Psalm 73 feeling a bit awkward that God's holding his right hand? No, he's very pleased. He finds us a comforting thing. God is God of by his right hand. Guiding him with your counsel. And look at this hope, friends, and believe you me, this is only a verse of hope if you're a believer. And afterward, verse 24, afterward, you'll receive me to glory. This is the glorious hope of the child of God. That's what summed up so well in the hymn we sometimes sing. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Who can doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, hear my faith in him to dwell. For I know what e'er befall me. Jesus doeth all things well. Forgive me for being morbid this morning as I give you my second morbid illustration. But again, sitting by the bedside of a young lad just turned 15 in the final days of his life with a brain tumor. A young lad who knew and loved the Lord Jesus with all his heart and displayed the most remarkable faith, even in those final days. And sitting there by his bedside with his old grandmother in her 80s, from further along the coast, Port Noki or somewhere like that, one of the wee fishing communities on the Murray Coast. And she would sit there and do you know what she'd say? It's a-ordered. And it's ordered wisely. It's a-ordered, and it's ordered wisely. Of course, she didn't want anybody to worry about her when all their thoughts were about Ross. So it was only after Ross had been laid to rest that she went to the doctor and discovered that she had less than a year. Mm. And I still remember sitting by her and hearing those same words. It's all ordered. And it's ordered wisely. For I know what e'er befalls me. Jesus doeth all things well. What a glorious comfort there is for the believer in these verses. He knows our location. He knows our days. Verse 13 to verse 18. These are wonderful, wonderful verses. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, this knitting together and this intricately woven. You know. Two scientists called Watson and Crick back in the 1950s got the Nobel Prize. And some would say Watson and Crick got the Nobel Prize for discovering DNA. Well, they didn't actually discover DNA. Other people had discovered it. What Watson and Crick got the Nobel Prize for was describing the way that DNA is structured. And having discovered using technology that had only become available at the beginning of the 1950s, X-ray crystallography as they call it, how intricately and how beautifully in every living cell the DNA in two strands is woven into a most incredible, as they call it, a double helix. Mm -hmm. What's a helix? Like a coil, a spring. 
but actually two coils that are beautifully interwoven together. As I say, they didn't discover it, they simply described it. Psalm 139 tells us, knitted together, intricately woven in the depths of the sea. What this also tells me, dear ones, is that we have a God who knows our days from the moment of conception. From the very moment of conception. And that's laid out for us in these verses. Your eyes saw my unformed substance and your book were written, every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. All our days, written in his book. Not just the date of birth and the date of death, but every day in between, written in his book. How precious is the psalmist. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I'm still with you. You know, each and every one of us has got one thing in common this morning. That is unless we didn't sleep at all last night. We woke up. We woke up. You know, friends, should the Lord not return within our lifetime, we'll also have one other thing in common. There will be a time when we'll close our eyes and we won't open again. Oh, with, with spiritual eyes, we'll open them in the presence of our Savior. Indeed, we shall. And the psalm says in verse 18, I awake and I am still with you. Isn't that glorious thought for the believer? That even in that day when our eyes close on earth, They'll open in the presence of the Savior. Mm-hmm. Isn't that what kept that lady, what was her name, Frances Van Alstyne or someone who's generally known as Fanny Crosby, the hymn writer? Mm-hmm. Lost her sight as a child, about two years of age, lost her sight. And folks said, what a, what a dreadful burden that must have been to live through life with. So awful to live with that. You know, that woman who wrote hymns like, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is and she said, well, there's one blessing. One day my eyes will open and the first person I will see is Jesus. Yeah. Friends, from conception to our final day, he knows our days. And we could well have sung in Christ alone this morning. We're not singing it this morning. But we could well have sung in Christ alone for nothing less than this verse from life's first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. He does. Many of us loved Billy Monroe. Didn't love him as much as Eunice loved him. Billy Sloan, sorry, Billy Sloan. Billy Sloan, you're so good, Billy. Please, God. <laughs> Billy Sloan, not as much as Eunice loved them, not as much as the, the, the girls loved him, loved their dad. Remember Sarah telling me, up in her hospital, as she had driven at breakneck speed from Harrington to get through to see her dad. I'm sorry, it was third morbid illustration. I just wonder what's going on. You see, Eunice had phoned her and said, they're saying we can get to see your dad. And she said, my mum thought that was a good thing. I knew that was a bad thing. Right in the heart of the, the first wave of COVID. And Sarah, whose joy it had been for me to baptised her just a few years earlier. She said, I sat with my dad. And I sang in Christ alone. In Christ alone. Yes, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. Please let me assure you, friends, that is a good place to be in. There is no better place to be in than to know that the one who loved us and gave himself for us 
commands our destiny. But more than that, verse 19 to verse 24 tells us that this is a God who knows our hearts. And when we read those first few verses in that sec section, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God, O oh men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? You know, you know, and perhaps the response of our hearts is read that. Well, that's not very nice. That's not very nice. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Well, let me say this, friends. These are Spirit-inspired words. These are the words the Holy Spirit wanted Asaph, the psalm writer, to write. Yet at the same time, they are a true reflection of what was in his heart. I wonder if there are times when we can actually be more offended at what people might think or feel if we spoke about their sin. Than our understanding of how God is offended by their sin. And sometimes we read words like this. And sometimes we read of some of the judgments that God has Perform and read about them in the Old Testament, and people would try to tell us, oh, well, we go to the Old Testament, he's a mean, nasty, you know, capricious God. God of the New Testament, Jesus, he's much nicer. No, there is only one God in three persons Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all three persons within that Godhead are there in the first verse of Genesis and the last verse of Revelation, they are there in all of Scripture. I can't help but feel sometimes when I feel that some of the things I read in Scripture of God's judgment are a bit harsh. That perhaps part of my problem is I don't really understand holiness the way God does. Because He is holy. But it's one thing to hate what God hates and hate others who are sin. Let's never forget God knows our hearts. God knows our hearts. Yes, there can be a holy hatred. But there's also a very real sense in which we need to be aware that God knows our hearts. Are we able honestly to say this morning to our gods, our God, search me. Oh God, I know my heart. God already does know his heart. So what is the psalmist saying when he's saying this? He is acknowledging. He is acknowledging the reality that our God is a God who searches our hearts, who tries us and knows our thoughts. Yet surely our prayer should be and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And you might say, well, does God really know? Does God know where I'm at? Does God know what I've been through? Does God know what I'm facing? Does God know what I've experienced? Does he? Does he? <clears throat> That's why I want to leave us this morning. With wonderful verses from Hebrews. He is the God who knows. And he's on the throne. Since then we have a great high priest. Who has passed through the heavens. Jesus the son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Don't let our doubts and our questions rob us. Of the grasp that we are holding on Christ. Don't allow ourselves to become discouraged and ask, does God really know? Does God really care? Because we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. 
but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. There's not something that any one of us has ever gone through that Jesus doesn't know what that feels like. Betrayal, he knows. Denial, he knows. Losing a loved one, shows his verse in the Bible. Jesus wept at the grave of Lazarus. Lies, oh, he knew what a lost of lies told against him. In every respect, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. <clears throat> so, what is our response? The very next verse. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time. This is what our God who knows says to us. Come here. Find what you need in me. Nothing else will ultimately satisfy. Find what you need in me. Receive mercy. Find grace. All of this in Christ. And by God's grace and mercy, we come in repentance and faith, believe in him, and find that he is the God who really does know. Friends, we're going to sing before we share together in communion. We're going to sing, Search me, O God, know my heart. <coughs>
that the disciples came to Jesus, saying, where will you have us prepare for the day of the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve and as they were eating, he said, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. They were very sorrowful. They began to say to him one after another, is, is it I, Lord? He answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes and is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. <coughs> Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. And we'll read on. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And there in that upper room at the Passover, Jesus instituted this remembrance which we now share together in, as in bread and wine we remember the body of Christ given and his life blood shed for the remission of our sins. So before we share, our brother Noel McConnell's will lead us together in prayer. Thank you, Noel. Oh, teach me what it meaneth that cross of lifted high with one the man of sorrows condemned to bleed and die. Oh, teach me what it cost thee to make a sinner whole. Oh, teach me, Savior, teach me the value of a soul. Father, we have been walking on holy ground this morning. Your word has revealed the wonder, the amazing wonder of your grace. For though you know us through and through, yet you love us. And that love took you all the way to Calvary. You laid down your life. You paid the price for our sin. You redeemed us and brought us into the family of God. Lord, we bless you. <coughs> we love you. And we thank you that we have the table to turn to. And it is your table. It doesn't belong to us. You've invited us to come. To break bread. To drink wine. And to remember you. Lord, we pray that as we do so, we will always remember that you're coming again. And we will do this sometime for the last time. But we bless you, Father, that we have that joy this morning, that privilege, that blessing of taking the bread speaks of your broken body, of taking the wine that speaks of your precious blood. As we do so, help us, Lord, to give all the praise and all of the glory to your holy name. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Jesus' words of institution in our ears, saying, Take heed, this is my body. We now take the, this wafer that represents the body that was broken for us and given for us. Let us, in remembrance, eat with thanksgiving. in the same way the Lord Jesus took the cup saying this cup is the blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins so let us drink of the cup remembering giving thanks for the forgiveness of sin that we have known through Christ's shed Father, we thank you that in the breaking of bread and the Lord's Supper, we find a great connection. For we share together and we recognize the connection that is ours as the body. sisters gathered, yet also mindful of brothers and sisters absent. Father is represented of those who are not with us. We remember our dear sister Anne Goodwin, praying that this morning Anne Goodwin would, would know your presence with her, would know your peace. Indeed, as we pray for Anne, we pray for Eddie. For Tricia, for Mary, for Janet. Pray that they too, Lord, would know your help in, in these days. We bless you for that precious faith that you were pleased to, to grant to Anne so many years ago. You have sustained her and kept her through so much. And we know that the God who has been enough in the past will still prove the same. And now, Father, as we sing our closing praise, pray you would take us to our homes in safety, that we might live our lives to bring you glory. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Closing praise will be when I survey the wondrous cross. <coughs>
Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us and go with us both now and forevermore.